Are, are you hurting? Are, are you struggling with either homosexual thoughts or, or sexual addiction? Or maybe even on the other side of recognizing that, that you have been uh, discriminatory towards somebody in church, or maybe you just don't even understand uh, homosexuality and how to deal with it, but yet you, the Lord has put a compassion on your heart to, to uh, uh, be able to minister to those that are affected by this issue. And so uh, what God has anointed me in the last couple of years is to start a uh, ministry, and that's called EXCEED. Uh, it's an acronym which stands for Excellence in Christ Through Evangelism for the Erotically Defiled. It's not limited just to homosexuality, which I, I, I do focus on because that's my experience, but I also relate to people who are erotically defiled, addicted to pornography or masturbation. And so here's where you come in. Uh, I have a uh, nonprofit organization that uh, I'm also in an umbrella ministry called Coming Out Ministries. And it's a group of five individuals that have come out of homosexuality uh, through Bible based, uh, uh, a Bible based uh, foundation. And we are united to uh, bring to Christianity uh, resources and opportunities to uh, open the door, if you would, on this topic that's been so much in the dark for hundreds of years. And so, where you come in is uh, you can uh, contact our website, you can go to exceedinglory.org or you can go to comingoutministries.org and we have resources and, and stories and testimonies that may not only touch your heart but also give you uh, opportunities to uh, point people uh, to us and also to fill your heart and recognize that, that God is able to reach those that are sexually defiled, not just from homosexuality, but also porn pornography addiction, which seems to be rampant in our church. So what we want to do is we want to be able to dash uh, the enemy's work, and we want to call sin what sin is, but we also, on the same side, want to let people know that the, the power of Jesus Christ to redeem and to restore is so powerful that it can overcome any obstacle. And that's the purpose of of my testimony today. My dad was a hot-headed Italian, and when he was home on leave, uh, he was so aggressive and, and a little bit abusive, but basically, for the most part, at a time when I needed to bond with uh, my own male gender, uh, I had rejected my dad because he was either absent, which I viewed as abandonment, or he was too aggressive, and I, I viewed that as, as scary or frightening. And so, if you would, in my own defense, I detached from my father as my gen gender role model. So for every little kid, their, their, their gender is like wet cement, and it becomes stamped in whatever gender they attach to or bond to. And so I didn't make that uh, transference to my father, and so what happened is I reverted back to my mother. So my cement, if you would, became more stamped in the feminine. And so I uh, grew up with three sisters. I didn't have any brothers. There were another, no other male figures in the home. So um, for me, uh, my gender became stamped in the feminine. I liked wearing uh, uh, my mom's clothes. I liked dressing up. I liked playing with dolls. I, I remember at six years old knowing that there was something wrong with, with me. But it, again, I, I couldn't help what I was attracted to. A, a little child can't uh, change their attractions as far as what they like to play with. But I knew that I was different. And I knew that I wasn't like the other little boys in the neighborhood. And I thought, I thought that God had made a mistake. I, I knew about God. My parents were, were both uh, Christians and uh, we went to church every Sunday. And I, I know that for me at six years old, knowing that God could correct a mistake, I started praying that God would change me and that the next morning I would wake up and I would be a girl. I like playing with dolls and, and whenever Christmas or birthdays came, I, I, I only got boy toys, which to me was a huge disappointment. And, and what began is this uh, covert behavior of playing with dolls, uh, you know, covertly because I'd get disciplined if I got caught. And so it, it began this whole deception, if you would, um, on the outside trying to pretend like I was every average little boy, but on the inside I was desperately crying out to, uh, to be affirmed and I wished that I was a girl growing up that way. Those feelings lasted well into my late teens. Um, and so when puberty came, uh, the best way that I can explain it is the sex that is the mystery becomes the attraction. And so for me, again, I, I understood girls. I grew up with a single mom and three sisters. And, and so uh, at puberty, I, I recognized that the sex that was a mystery for me was actually my own gender, the male. And so 
as, uh, as, thir as puberty began, uh, my thoughts became focused on fantasies about men and not about women. Uh, not understanding the dangers of masturbation and pornography, uh, which I had been exposed to at an early age. Uh, one of the ways that I also can um, confirm about the gender detachment is I, I had, uh, my parents were divorcing and my dad took us uh, to the lake, my sisters and I, and when he announced that he and my mom were getting a divorce, which we knew was eminent, uh, I remember the thought that my first thought, my first reaction is, you're out of here, finally, you're out of here, was my first reaction uh, to my father when he said that. But my sisters were upset, they were crying, they were hysterical. And I remember thinking to myself, why are they so upset? You know, he's finally gone, which to me now, as an adult, confirms that I had detached from my father long before uh, it was even conscious for me. So again, uh, the beginning of pornography and uh, masturbation began uh, when puberty hit. And as many times as I would try to change my thinking and, and fantasize about uh, the opposite sex, uh, what happened is the, uh, the homoerotic thoughts would come back in and eventually I just gave up fighting. I couldn't fight it anymore. And so uh, at 14 years old, I actually uh, was able to give my heart to the Lord and I knew that my, my self-abuse behavior was out of control. Sometimes I would indulge it up to 10 times a day. And for me, it began an addiction at a very early age, which lasted into my 40s. And so as I, um, as I became a young adult, I remember accepting Jesus into my heart at 14. I got baptized and I went to a, an all-Christian all school, a boarding school. And while I was there, I had a roommate who I had met at summer camp the summer before. And he was the only person that I knew, so we decided to be roommates. Now, my roommate had uh, some history at juvenile detention, and um, he was well-versed in homosexual behavior. And I believe that he recognized something in me. And against my, my better judgment, against what I knew was not according to what God's will was for me, uh, I gave in to uh, homosexual behavior with this roommate. And uh, I knew that when I went to bed that night that, that God... God could not, uh, that God, not that he was angry or upset at me so much as that I was not worthy of him, that I was not worthy of heaven. And what was so profoundly shocking to me was the fact that, that it felt good. The, the, the act that I had engaged in, it confirmed something to me. It felt natural. It felt good. And, and so what went through my mind then was just this horrific thought of the total rejection of God and yet it affirmed the fact that I was in this, um, it affirmed to me that I was on the outside of what God's reach was. Uh, I remember going to the, uh, the Bible conference within a couple weeks. My roommate got kid, I kicked out. I promptly got a girlfriend and, and tried to do all of the right things to, to change my behaviors, but I didn't recognize that I needed to hang on to Jesus Christ. I didn't understand that He loved me to the point where where he would make himself available to me. I thought that I had to earn his love. I thought that I had to do right things to earn his um, approval of me. And so again, the, the thoughts didn't go away. The uh, self-abuse didn't go away. Uh, that continued to stay with me. But my behavior started to change. Uh, I kept a girlfriend until I dropped out of college my sophomore year. And uh, I remember uh, moving to Florida. And when I moved to Florida, I had actually started working in this hospital and I found a woman who was also struggling with same-sex attraction and, and we confided in each other. And we determined that we were going to find out from Christian culture, our church, if there was any redemption available for homosexuals. I, it took me a few months to pick out, to handpick this one man that was an elder of the church and I thought he had been down that road and that not homosexuality but definitely sexual sin. And so I asked him one night if I could speak to him. And he said, sure, Mike, you know, what's up? And I said, well, it has to do with women. And before I could say another word, he said something so derogatory about women that I knew I, kn I couldn't share my secret. I knew I couldn't confide in him what the true issue was. And after he was done speaking, I thanked him. I walked out of church and, and I, just, I just shook my head and I said, God, if that's the best you can do, I'm out of here. I, I, can't, I can't resolve these thoughts and these attractions in my head and, and I can't get any legitimate answers from church culture. I, I couldn't continue this struggle between what was raging inside of my mind and, and, uh, and, and trying to please God. And so what happened next is for the next 20 years, uh, I went head, headlong right into the gay culture. 
Um, my first lover, which I was hoping would be a monogamous relationship, introduced me to all kinds of, uh, of sexual ills, S&M behavior, group sex, uh, dirty bookstores, and I could go on, but um, what, was, what was so amazing to me was that within a very short period of time, within, I would say, two to three years, I had become a sexual addict, and these, these illicit situations were, were the craving for them just increased more and more, sometimes up to two and three encounters a day, uh, definitely at least one to three a week uh, for the next 20 uh, years. Uh, what was amazing is occasionally uh, the thought would cross my mind whether I was within the bounds of, of what God could reach. And I remember thinking about my life and where I was at and, and thinking that I must, have, I must have gone past the ability for God to even reach me because of my uh, covert behavior. I was never faithful in any of the five long-term relationships that I had uh, because they couldn't satisfy what I was ultimately looking for. Uh, the relationships were competitive at best, and most of the time it was uh, emotionally and, and sensory uh, foundational. And so once, the, once the, uh, the visual or the sexual part wore off, what I was left with was still inadequate feelings, uh, feelings of emasculation, not feeling like I was man enough or that I was ever a man. So I believe that that was the, the beginning, the, uh, the origin of, of the homosexual behavior for me. I had become the poster child for the, the, the gay lifestyle. I was a hairdresser and an aerobic instructor. I, had, uh, I, had, I was surrounded by friends that supported me in my gay lifestyle, my gay relationships. I had hit pay dirt in gay lifestyle. I had a boyfriend with big blue eyes and, and uh, a millionaire and drove around in a convertible Mercedes and yet I knew, I still knew that there was something missing in my life and, and I would uh, think about, um, was this the best that my life was going to get? I was at the top of my game and yet what was going on behind the scenes that I wasn't aware of, uh, um, I had two sisters that were praying for me, two sisters that I thought totally supported me in my lifestyle and yet behind the scenes they were faithfully praying and, and for years they were lifting up me in prayer that God would be able to reach me. And so what was amazing is my sister was actually getting remarried to her husband that had uh, had an affair on her and left her. They had divorced, been divorced for three years and were now getting remarried. Uh, again, feeling like Christianity was for losers. Uh, I remember reluctantly going to the wedding to be supportive to my niece and nephew. But as I was sitting there in that church and I saw my brother-in-law come forward into the baptismal and make an open confession to the church about how he had fooled around on his wife, how he had left them for three years. He thanked the church for taking care of them financially while he was uh, basically a deadbeat dad. I started to see that that wasn't my brother-in-law. I, I believe that I was in the presence of the Holy Spirit and, and tears started to fill my eyes. I was so moved by this man that I had absolutely hated for so long and, and thought that was a fraud. And so that night I had prepared that I was going to act out sexually and I'd had my rental car and I had my hotel room all available to make sure that, you know, that the layer was set, if you would. But what happened is when I returned to the hotel room, I was so moved by the Holy Spirit, I couldn't, I couldn't get up, I couldn't take a shower, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't even watch TV. The Lord was struggling with my heart and my mind. And within three months, uh, I'd returned home and within three months, uh, the Lord had brought me into these circumstances and the Holy Spirit was moving on my heart. My sister invited me to an evangelistic series, which I still don't know why I agreed, but I went and the first time that I walked into this tent meeting, uh, the young minister said something about they were having a Q&A and the first question was, will homosexuals be in heaven? And he gave a very biblical understanding about homosexuality. And my sister freaked out about the question. She thought I would just absolutely bolt right out of the tent. But you know, the Holy Spirit was working with me and He was moving with me in a very compassionate way and I wasn't offended by the question. But the next week I ended up going to a different evangelistic series that was in the area. Only this guy was from a gang and he was uh, half black and half Spanish and, and it was a very gritty gospel. And that reached me. It wasn't perfect in its, in its presentation, but what it did is it, it struck through all of the garbage and the darkness that was around my soul and it hit th straight through to my, uh, to my heart. And within uh, just a few weeks, I made a stand to be baptized. When the, when the preacher made the final call, he said, for some of you, he said, tonight will be the last invitation from the Holy Spirit. Not because the Holy Spirit is giving up, but because you'll walk out of here and you won't be able to hear that message again. 
And I knew that that was the culmination of all those invitations throughout the years where the Holy Spirit was, was asking me to come back and I, and I was struggling. And so as I sat there in the chair, I, I cried out to Christ. And I said, Jesus, I, I'm not worthy to go forward. And I said, I give you my heart, but I can't go up there. And I knew that that was me. I knew that if I passed up this opportunity that I would never have another chance. And I believe that angels brought me forward because my next conscious thought is I was standing up front and my sister was crying beside me and, and I looked at her and I said, why are you here? And, and she said, because you are. And I realized then that the Lord just needed me to give him my heart and he was so good to do the rest. And so my sister asked me in the parking lot that night what I was going to do with my boyfriend. And I looked at her and I said, all I know is that Jesus loves me for who I am. All I know is that I'm gay. I tried to change. That never worked. And I said, I asked that God would change me and that never worked. I said, all I know is that Jesus loves me for who I am. And my sister was good enough to stop. The next morning I was baptized with a sexual addiction and a boyfriend. And Jesus began, began this journey with me. I didn't know how to trust men. I, I was so untrustworthy myself. I was a fraud and a fake. I, I presented myself one way, but on the other side, I was a sexual deviant with an addiction. And so, as Jesus began this journey with me, I fell, and I fell a lot. I was hoping that once I came up out of the baptismal water that, that I'd be freed of my homosexual thoughts and, and the addictive drive, but I came up out of that water just the same, uh, just the same understanding that I'd had before with, an, a boy, with a boyfriend. But Jesus began this journey with me, and what he started to do was he started to address all the years of the, uh, of the emasculating comments and, and behaviors that I had experienced from men beginning with my father. And as he started to, to bathe over me with his love and, and to let me know that, that he was going to be there for me, every time that I fell, Jesus was there telling me, Mike, get back up. And every time I would get back up, it, it was messy and it was dirty, but, but Jesus was faithful to me. As it says in First, uh, First John 1 John 1.9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. I wasn't faithful. And so I started to recognize that, that I couldn't I couldn't become perfect before I came to Christ, that, that I had to come to Christ as I was. And it was His perfection that He wanted to pour over me. And as He was faithful to me, a very slow process, which took years, He started to address all of the emasculating comments from not only the little boys in school that called me sissy or queer or fag, but also the women as well that it emasculated me and, and, and I had come away with the thoughts that not only was I not male, but I certainly wasn't a man. And so Jesus started to show me that according to Genesis, he says that God made the male and female. And so when I was crying out to God as a young boy, wondering why I was a boy and that I should have been a girl, I started to recognize that, that God made me exactly who he intended to, me to be. He said that before the earth was made, I knew you. And that word no is an intimacy. It, he, knew, he knew not only that I was to be male, but he knew inside the struggle that I was going to have and that he was not going to leave me nor forsake me. And so as I started to walk legitimately with Jesus Christ, I started to understand more about the plan that he had for me. And I also started to see that he had hope for me that, that I could change not only my attractions, but also change uh, the history that had come behind it. So as I continued to walk with the Lord, and, and it was a very slow process, I remember at 17 years old that I prayed that God would take my life. At 17 years old, being addicted to masturbation and, and the homosexual thoughts that were raging inside my head, I knew that gay culture was, was screaming out and that it was out in the adult lifestyle. And I asked God that He would take me, that if this was the closest that I was, that He would take me then. But only he knew that because of the, the masturbation and the self-abuse that I indulged in, that I wasn't ready for heaven. And I believe that what God said is he said, I'll let out the rope, Mike, and there will be a time when I'll bring it back in and I'll address it. And he certainly did because in my 40s, I realized that God, that God had saved uh, there a time to where he knew that I would be able to come back to him. And so at 17, I thought that he hated me. I thought that he ignored me or that I didn't matter to him because the only father that I could relate to was the earthly father that I had and that was the experience that I had had so I viewed God the same way so as I walked with Jesus for several years seven years it took I started to realize that I had a relationship with Jesus Christ he had proved to me that he was there for me each and every day and as I would fall he would uh, be my encourager to tell me to get up and then when I read in the Bible where it talks about if you've seen me you've seen the father 
And that was profound for me because after seven years of walking as a Christian, I realized that the same goodness that my Savior Jesus Christ had was the same goodness that my Father in Heaven had. And that totally and forever has changed the way I see the Father. And the healing that I've experienced from understanding the true nature of the Father, that He is for me and not against me, it helps me daily to walk uh, with legitimacy, to, to give up the thoughts, to give up the temptations that come. And, and now I've been given the freedom of breaking that sexual addiction as well as the pornography addiction and even uh, the homosexual thoughts. And so what's been amazing is, is God has been faithful to me far beyond anything that I could have ever given Him or done for Him. So what good is my story? It's a dime a dozen because just like me, there are several people, many people, thousands of people who have also come out of homosexual lifestyle. Well, their stories may not be as public, but I believe that God has anointed me and several others to give this story. And, and, and the idea of giving the story isn't just to help those who struggle with, with homosexual thoughts and attractions, but I believe it's also for the body of Christ. They want to reach out not only to their members in their church, but more intimately to their family members, to husbands, to wives, to children, to cousins, sisters, brothers, neighbors, uh, people in the grocery store that you come into contact with. Because again, if we are the body of Christ, we should be God with skin on. And we should know how to reach out to our brothers and sisters and to not, to not uh, uh, beat them up with the gospel. The idea of the gospel was to save sinners, not to rebuke them and tell them that they'll go to hell. Because I got that message at a very early age. One of the things that I tell people is quit telling me what I'm doing is wrong and show me that there's a way out. So I believe that that's what this message is good for is it gives people an opportunity to recognize the goodness and the love and the mercy that Jesus Christ has for each one of us and that there is hope. And not only is there hope, but, but my sisters as an example, a powerful, fervent prayer for those uh, that you're praying for and to never give up because I am a testimony of their faithful prayers. I had actually gone on vacation 10 days before my baptism and, and my job was to bring the alcohol. So I went with my boyfriend and my roommate and her boyfriend and, and while we were gone, the, the Lord was speaking to me through the, the seminar that I'd been going to, the presentation. And so when I came back, uh, my boyfriend was out of town and I was coming to the very last meeting. And as I went to that last meeting, um, there was no time for them to even get my information. I made, I made my stand and I had been missing for the last 10 days of, the, of this uh, seminar. And, and the next day I was baptized into this culture. And uh, as I was baptized in, my boyfriend returned the next day and he said, do you know what you got baptized into? And I said, yes. And he said, your church doesn't accept uh, homosexual, uh, homosexuality. And there was still this there was still this protective coating from the Holy Spirit. I wasn't offended by that. I knew that I was responding to the invitation of God, not even necessarily uh, the message that I, that uh, the church that I had become uh, baptized in. And as I continued to walk with Jesus Christ, I believe that He protected me from, from those folks in the church that would have seen my behavior or, or understood who I was and that they would have counseled me or, or possibly even rejected me. But God protected me even from that element until long after I'd been there. And as the Lord was uh, reaching out to me, He was also putting in my presence other men that were struggling with homosexuality within that denomination. What happened is we began a, a core group, if you would, and we started to watch uh, resources that, that each individual uh, man had actually uh, accumulated with resources about coming out of homosexuality. And it wasn't until I started watching some of these testimonies of other men and women that it had come out that I started to realize that maybe God could help me too. As a matter of fact, looking at some of those uh, the, uh, videos, I remember looking at some of those men and women and thinking, if God could help them, He certainly could help me. And that was God putting those resources in my path. There, there was no... Uh, there was no program or, or criteria, if you would, for baptizing homosexuals into, into my denomination. But what God did do is He started to call me out and to give to me uh, resources and Bible verses that I could claim and to recognize that God had healing for everybody. Uh, I remember one quote talking about how the same Jesus that, that walked 2,000 years ago, healing men spiritually, physically, and mentally, is the same Jesus today. And so that helped to give me hope that if God called it an abomination, he better have the answer for it or he's not a savior at all.